welcome everybody to uh, uh, Q and Live Q and A. We finished service a little early today because, well, I was a short preacher today. So, <laughs> uh, so thank you and thank you for joining us. If you have questions, you can type them into the chat, uh, and yeah, and we'll we will respond and we'll continue our conversation as we've been doing. So, mm -hmm. I hope everybody had a merry Christmas. Uh, so yeah, and it's the second day of Christmas. So. Uh, two turtle doves, a partridge and a pear tree. <laughs> <laughs> and that actually has meaning, right? Yes, the whole song? It does. They all they're all for I don't know exactly which what's for what day, but they're all they all match something on that day. So today is two turtle doves, right? And we yeah. heard in the, the the lesson two turtle doves, three you know, we heard in the lesson about how Mary and Joseph have to give two turtle doves. So Cool. Yeah. I like that. Well you know what? I wanna start with what was the big question? that we talked about you know, promoting. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, and it's based on today's reading from Isaiah, because Isaiah speaks here in the Old Testament mm -hmm. of having attained salvation. Yeah. Um, and my fundamentalist friends mm -hmm. have insisted, I mean, all the way through college when Campus Crusade was trying to mm -hmm. you know, beat me over the head with the message, they insisted that you can only, 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 only have salvation through Christ mm -hmm. and belief in Christ. What is the formal doctrine on that? Well, what, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it yeah. brings that because there have been 105 billion Homo sapiens. Yes. You right. know, on Earth. And the total number of Christians throughout history, I did this calculation last mm -hmm. night, is between 13 and 13.5 billion. Okay. So you're talking only 10% of humanity? Right. Would be have salvation if that was true? Right. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, so whose formal doctrine is always ah. kind of the catch, right? So is yeah. that one of those each denomination well, kind of? Every, I don't know about each denomination, but every, if you think about Christian denominations as existing in major streams, mm -hmm. you know, each major stream has kind of their own quasi-thought on that, okay. you know? Um, uh, and so I guess I would say that, um, how to put this? So there's a couple distinctions we need to make, okay. right? Um, yeah. Set up our variables. Here. Right. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're set up. Uh, there's a writer I read talks about buckets. So, okay. you know, separate your buckets first, you know? And so, okay. First thing, um, there's a difference between what we call universalism and universal salvation. Okay, so okay, uh, so one idea is that all are saved. Okay, right, you know, so that could be one answer to the question. So Every, is that universal salvation? Well, so this is the universal side of the question. Okay, that all are saved. That could be one answer. Okay, that all one hundred and three billion or however many uh, <laughs> people, the Homo sapiens that ever existed, it's all saved, all of it. Okay. Period. But then there's two different rivers there. There's two different buckets. There's universalism, which is all are saved no matter what. Uh, okay. Uh, and that's something that's held mostly by things like Unitarian Universalists, you know. Uh, hence their name. Yeah, hence their name. Right? Okay. That's where they get it. Um, and then there's something called universal salvation. Uh, and universal salvation is the Christian version of this. And the Christian version is that all are saved on account of Jesus Christ. So it's still because of him. It's all because of him. Okay. That there is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ, but all are saved because of Jesus Christ. Okay. So that's one possible answer. That's a stream of thought that goes back all the way to the church fathers. Mm -hmm. where you'll find like Gregory of Nyssa is an early church father and people like that all kind of uh, some of people will hold that position. Okay. So that's one answer. So, so by that bucket, that, by that answer. Right. That answer. You don't really need to believe, but we believe as Christians that. But we through. believe, but. I mean, the argument goes if it's truly grace, you know, then. Um, and God says in the Bible, or let's put it simply this God says in the Bible, I desire all shall be saved. Yeah. So the question is, does God get what God wants? Mm. You know, um, and people who would believe in the universal salvation stream in that bucket, 
would say, of course God gets what God wants. Yeah. You know, it may take a while, but God will get what God wants, period. So we can change whatever Lola wants slowly gets to yeah. whatever Yahweh wants. Yahweh, Yahweh gets. gets. Okay. One answer. Um, then there's the no. <laughs> you know, or some people, some people are not saved for various reasons. Um, Campus Crusade, yes, would probably say they have not formally said, I declare Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior and have accepted him into his heart, into my heart. And so, therefore, anybody who doesn't do that... Tough luck. Tough luck, you know. Um, uh, speak the doctrine... So, in the Apostles' Creed, right, we have that line that goes, he descended into hell. Yeah. Um, so... The people who do not believe that all are saved, um, this is why we have that line in the creed. Is because what that says is that Christ descended into hell and took care of people like Isaiah and Abraham and all those people be born beforehand. And the book of Peter, First Peter, says he has this line where he go. It's just this one line where he goes, "Christ on the holy, Christ while he was dead went and preached to the spirits imprisoned." Mm. You know, and so the idea is that there was that after death people could receive faith, you know, because Christ went into hell itself. Yeah. We call this the harrowing of hell, that Christ kind of led a divine rescue mission. That's why Christ is in hell. It's yeah. Like he's, he's breaking all the spirits out of hell that need to be broken. Well, that, how does that relate to, like, the Mormon belief that you can baptize yeah. ancestors who have long been dead into right. Mormonism. Right. And so they think you can still do that, whereas if that might be true, but I baptism in our our tradition is only for the living. You know, and, and so um, uh, right. And so if people can be saved after death, that's really God's business at that point, not ours anymore. Yeah. You know. Um so that's a whole other stream of uh, uh, that some people that you need faith in Jesus Christ to be saved, uh, and that th so not everybody will be will be saved. Yeah. And then there's people like me who are kind of wishy washy, and I'll say in the middle, <laughs> you know, between those two, between Campus Crusade and the Universal Salvationists are probably the vast majority of Christian denominations, which say, well, some people are going to hell. I just have no idea who. who, okay. And I have no idea how many. And I tend to think it's going to be a small number. Um, my, my theology professor put it this way. I think Jesus Christ is the best chance <laughs> you have. I can mm -hmm. guarantee salvation in Jesus Christ through the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. You know? Guarantee it through hearing the word, receiving the sacraments, participating in the church. You're in. You're in. Okay. I, I cannot guarantee any other way. Yeah. That does not mean that there is no other way. I just have no guarantees. Yeah. You know, um, it is entirely possible and probable that God's salvation is larger than the church, larger than the Lutheran church, larger than the church, the whole church. I. I fully believe that's a likely possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I just can't promise it because it's not a promise God makes. Yeah. I can promise that by hearing the word and, you know, I can make a guarantee. I can't make a guarantee outside the church gotcha. is kind of how I think about it. Yeah, I had a conversation with a Catholic priest mm -hmm. on um, a similar topic. Yeah. I have just read a biography of Gandhi, mm -hmm. and I was talking to him about that, about mm -hmm. how can you have someone like Gandhi, mm -hmm. who clearly did so much good for so many people, yeah, um, and yet was devout Hindu, mm -hmm. and say he's not going to go to heaven, right? And he he said that you know Catholic theology, similar to what you were saying, is yeah. that there is that clearly people who are good, so good. Yeah. are not going to be excluded from heaven just because they're not the same religion. Right, you know, and, and, right. And I would say, so that gets into a little bit of a works righteousness thing, you know, yeah. as a Catholic. And so my thing would be, um, uh, Lutheran theology says that you have the capacity to, you can't say yes to God. You know, you can't say yes to faith. 
uh, that's something only God gives you. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say no, uh, though. You always have the power to say no. Yeah. And we don't have free will. We have free won't. You know, we can say no. Um, and so, my argument is that there will be people who uh, will say no to God. That they that they won't have it on God's terms. You know, they will say no. Um, uh, and I just don't think God Gandhi's one of those people. <laughs> you know, I mean, fundamentally, <laughs> that's really what it comes down yeah. to. And final judgment, I doubt Gandhi is one of those people. Gotcha. You know, um, there are some people I think that will be, but not, um, not Gandhi. You know, or <laughs> that kind of stuff. So. And really, hell is heaven and hell are God's business. Actually, you know, I mean, that's actually um, one of my favorite theologians says, I, "I don't think universal salvation will happen, but I hope it does." <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. And that's my attitude: is I, all the biblical evidence. I would say I'm not a I'm not a believer in that universal salvation stream of things. I would love to be proven wrong. And I hope I am proven wrong. Yeah. You know, and that's my attitude. Is I hope to be proven wrong on this one. You know. I hope you're wrong, too, because I, I worry mm -hmm. because I have the same attitude as Groucho Marx. Mm -hmm. I would never belong to a club that would have me as a member. Well, yeah. <laughs> well that's the whole point, right? You know, is that, um, <laughs> yeah, and that's the whole point of, of Christianity, you know. It's like none of us deserve to get in. Um, uh where this gets really tricky and where the whole debate really hinges is the Book of Romans, Paul says, we are justified by faith, and it says, in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. right? Prepositions. Prepositions are really important. So if you actually look at the Greek there, it's in the genitive. And the genitive case is translated as of. It's the case of possessive. Oh. So in this particular case, it always gets translated as in, but technically, the word is in a particular case where it should say, we are justified by the faith of, of Jesus Christ. That's a very different statement. Very much so. You know, so there's a big debate there. Is it in or is it of? Yeah, because of does paints a whole different picture. Right. He's of, got faith in me. Right. He's, and it's, that's what counts. Right, or it's Jesus' faith that gets transferred to all of us. All of us, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And is it of or is it in? <laughs> you know, it, it's a, that's a tricky um, that's a tricky thing. Well, in that case, I'm going to be a literalist and go with of because yeah. it's much more optimistic. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, and, and just one last thing, and this, mm -hmm. and we had been talking about C.S. Lewis before everything mm -hmm. started, but that brought up, you know, I pointed out there's been 105 billion mm -hmm. Homo sapiens. Yeah. And I said it intentionally like that because humans mm -hmm. are technically also Neanderthals, Cro-Magnon, yeah. um, and so where do we? Where do you draw the line? Scientifically, right. they're still human. Yeah. Theologically, are they? So, like, right. if you talk about original sin, that kind of thing. Right. Did Neanderthals have original sin? Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, where, yeah. where where was was it Homo sapien? Adam was. Right. You know, or <laughs> was that it? the metaphoric Adam was yeah. the first Homo sapien, right. or, or the was mitochondrial it? Eve? That was, yeah. 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 No. Um, was it? I don't have a good you know, answer. Og in the cave was the first one. Right. I don't, I don't have a good answer to that one, you know. Um, uh, sin is a condition of the world, the whole world. You know, it's not just, like, even creation is under the bondage of sin until all things are, until all things are made new. Yeah. Right. You know, and you see this in natural disasters, right? You know, they wreck... Horrible, like, this is the work of sin. All, everything in the cosmos. It's actually the Greek word is cosmos, you know, is, yeah. is under the bondage of sin. And so um, I, I tend to think, yes, it includes our, you know, our predecessors, our predecessors yeah. okay. right? Um, you know, they found that, that, um, that body of the Neanderthal up in the Alps, the, Decades the ago. The Ice Man. Or, yeah, the yeah. Ice Man, right? But it, it was clear from what we can tell he was running from people. You know, he was running from somebody. Yeah. Because he had wounds and he was, you know, and, and so, like, even all the way back then, 
you know, yeah. here's this guy who it, it, there's still sin in his world. Obviously, yeah. he's running from something. Yeah. You know, and um, yeah, and he was on, from what they can tell, he was on just like today. He was on a peaceful trading mission, right? And he's running from something. Yeah, you know, and and um, and and so yeah, that there are a ton. Uh, sin is just everywhere. Yeah. And I, I think it infects all of us. But right, where is the point at, you know, it's an interesting philosophical question. Where does the image of God that it talks about in Genesis 1, that we're all, where does that begin? Yeah. Is that, and, you know, it is like the Lucy skeleton, like, which is more monkey than human, you know. But, it's, but it's, still clearly on the way to human. It, right, yeah. it's still clearly, right, on the path. The Neanderthals, right, you know, where where does that begin? It's yeah. hard to know. Yeah. Yeah, and even with Neanderthals in particular, you know, yeah. most Caucasians actually have a ton of Neanderthal DNA. Right, exactly, right. So so, so where did that all, you know, um, who knows? <laughs> it's one of those <laughs> questions I'll ask God uh, when I get to have Yeah, them. oh, I've, right. I've got a roster way right. longer than this now. Right, right, right. Um, getting, I'm going to jump out. I want to focus mm -hmm. the whole time on Isaiah, so I want to get to the New Testament real mm -hmm. quick. Um, the gospel reading. Yeah. Yet again, we have you know Simeon and Anna, mm -hmm. and a, a couple of questions there. One that's theological, one that's just practical. Mm -hmm. I'll start with the theological. Yet again, when Simeon comes up mm -hmm. and says, "Oh look, boy, this kid's special." Yeah. Um, and Anna, you know, mm -hmm. every time through Jesus's childhood mm -hmm. that anybody says, "Hey, look at this kid." Right. Wow, he's something special. Yeah. Joseph and Mary are surprised. Mm -hmm. Like they had never heard from Gabriel, like they had never heard from the shepherds right. at the Nativity, like they'd never heard from the Magi. Right. They continue to be surprised every time the subject comes yeah, up. Yeah, right. Why? Is it just you know, a literary oversight, or um, do we have dueling histories going on? Yeah, I mean, I, well, so there's always dueling histories, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's part of it. Because, like, Luke has no knowledge of the myth, or... If he has, he didn't think it was worth putting in his story, right? So, um, narrative-wise, in Luke chapter two, they don't know the Magi haven't come to them, okay. right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a difference, I think, between knowing what Gabriel said and hearing what everybody else is saying, you know. And so, Gabriel says he'll be Messiah, he'll be Savior, you know, but. Okay, let's assume in Anna's sake, you know, there's three times they're required to go to the temple, you know, every year. Mm -hmm. uh, four, actually. So there's four major pilgrimage festivals to the temple, you know. And so um, so four times a year for their whole life, Mary and Joseph have probably seen Anna, like, hanging out there, uh -huh. you know. And um, she's just Anna, you know. And suddenly she starts going off about how this kid is all that God did, you know, the embodiment of all of God's promises. You know, yeah. it would be shocking even if you knew about um, even if you knew about Gabriel. You know, yeah. it would be shocking to have, to see this actually impact the rest of the world around you. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I don't know, if you go further in the Gospels it's very clear they think Jesus is crazy his family, you know, at one point. They, they, they tell him Come on inside. We'll put you in the padded room, <laughs> basically. You yeah. Know? And Jesus says, "I reject you as my parent, you know, as my mother and father, and, <laughs> and my brothers and sisters." Yeah. You know, and so they know all this, but I make fun of the song "Mary, Did You Know?" But it asks a poignant question. You know, where did, what was the extent of Mary and Joseph's knowledge? Mm -hmm. You know, where were its limits? Um, uh, similar with Simeon, you know, it's one of those things of how often was this guy here, you know? Um, and suddenly he's talking about, you know, I can die now. Yeah. You know, that would be a shocking, like, that's what he's singing. He goes, okay, I can die now because I have seen everything that God has promised yeah. me. Yeah. You know, that would be shocking even if you knew Gabriel's part of the story. Well, that, that, that makes me wonder about what prophets are here now and we just think they're crazy homeless people. Oh, yeah. You know, because I imagine it was the same back then. You know, mm -hmm. you know, prophet around every 
corner, you know. You're right, profit. Well, you know, and if it's, when I was in Atlantic City, mm -hmm. when we lived there, um, I used to go and have lunch. I lived within walking distance of the beach, and I'd go up and have lunch on the beach just yeah. past the boardwalk every day. And there were yeah. the prophets proselytizing and preaching up and right. down the boardwalk. Yep. And I still remember coming back, and this prophet I had seen every day, mm -hmm. um, and just rode off as a little bonkers. Yep. As I'm walking back to get back to work, he's got a, a small crowd, maybe eight, ten people that are mm -hmm. paying attention to him. And as I'm going by, he suddenly wheels on me mm -hmm. and says, and you, you with your electric ray gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was shocked. Right, yeah, <laughs> you know? right. You know, and I'm just, is, is that the same thing? Is, and how, mm -hmm. A, was that the same thing? Were there a bunch of people yeah. who seemed to be prophets ranting, mm -hmm. you know, yep. outside? And how would you know who was legit and who was just a little bonkers? Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> because it may apply today. We may be getting right. you know, massive messages and we're just right. saying, ah, it's just yeah. the, that's so crazy Bob. The ancient world had my favorite character that's ever existed, uh, and that's the panhandling philosopher. And these are people who would stand on the street corner and like shout philosophy at you. And then they'd demand money from you because they'd say they just taught you. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so this is a regular character all across the ancient world. So e equals MC squared, 10 bucks. Yeah, right. Okay. Basically, you know, or uh, form does not equal function, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's $5. Right, yeah. right, right. You know, <laughs> right. They'd spout off philosophy lessons. They just, and they'd follow you. They'd harass you, basically. And they'd, they'd follow you. And then this is. Oh, I love that concept of harassing philosophers. Right. This is what they actually think Socrates really was in real history, and that's why they killed him. <laughs> he was such a nuisance. You're right, he was such a nuisance in Athens. It's like, okay, we got to get rid of you. And so, yeah, these people are all over, you know, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but uh, it gets back to that principle in Acts, right? Mm -hmm. That, um, well, if it is the word of God, it will, you can't, we won't be able to stop it. And if it isn't, it will drift away. You know, that, that's why there's that console to wait, you mm -hmm. know, and um, yeah, that's the hard part about being in the moment with prophets is you don't, you, Prophet Jeremiah, you know, there were other prophets that were talking in Jeremiah's day. Mm -hmm. And it was clear they were all saying the Babylonians aren't coming and if they do, God will beat the Babylonians and we'll be safe and we'll be fine. And those people are actually the, who the people in charge are listening to. Jeremiah, mm -hmm. is, this is why Jeremiah feels so depressed all the time in the book is because He's the only prophet who's saying the kingdom will be destroyed. We will lose. You are about to go into exile. And there's nothing you can do about it because God has decreed this yeah. because of all the problems you've caused. You know, and, um, he's, but he's the only person saying that. You know, and, and you know, if I put myself in King Zedekiah's position, who was king at the time, you know, mm -hmm. I've got my official court prophets over here telling me, we'll be fine, you know. I've got lonely old Jeremiah, who's been a pain in my butt, my whole rule, you know, telling me we're all going to lose. Yeah. Who do I listen to? Hello, court prophets, you know. I, <laughs> my uh, feel-good prophets. Yeah, yeah. My, well, not just feel-good, but it sounds more plausible, you know, because it had happened before. God had defeated people before. Mm. You know, God had saved people before. It's it sounds more plausible than what Jeremiah is saying. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that is the hard part about prophets. I've I've met people who I think really have the gift of prophecy, mm -hmm. and um, they tell you something, and you're like, Ooh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't want that. Like, <laughs> like yeah, they usually turn out to be right, though. You know, yeah. and. Um, or they haven't turned out yet, but it's always in the back of my head. It's like, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and um, and so yeah, I think those people are out there, but it is really hard, and you sometimes you just gotta wait. Yeah. And uh, this is why prayer is important, you know, it's because and why no no prophecy, and Paul says this in the New Testament, no prophecy will be confirmed out will be contra what the church teaches, you know, okay. uh, and will be contra what we read in the gospel, you know, and, and, and this is why if, if, so, if somebody online, somebody watching really feels like they have the gift of prophecy, this is why we speak it in the whole community, 
you know, is because um, it will not just stay with one person. You know, even in Jeremiah, it didn't just stay with Jeremiah. Yeah. There were other people who... Um, so prophecy never exists just in the one person. Yeah. You know, that's a good... That's a good metric also for, is this true or not? It's like, well, has it been confirmed outside of the one person? Yeah, I yeah. like that. It's like... You know, Even Simeon and Anna, right? There's Simeon and there's Anna. Yeah, you that's know, true. There's two, right? There's in the not, same instant. In right, incident. in yeah. the same moment, you know? And, and so uh, it won't just... If it's just the one person, it's always just the one person. That's a good sign yeah. to... Mm, <laughs> hold up a second. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That mm -hmm. explains why I wasn't accosted mm -hmm. to obtain my electric ray gun because right. it was just the one right. person. Right, you know, yeah. and three other people said to you, why, you know, where's your electric ray gun? Then, then, then. <laughs> Something may be up here. Yeah, yeah, then you better go looking. You well, know? That, that seems pretty critical even to the founding of, of, of Christianity in that, mm -hmm. you know, in Jesus' time, contemporaneously, there were several people, yeah. you know, claiming to be Messiah. Right. Including another Yeshua, another, another right. Jesus. Another Jesus. And, and later, you know, there's actually... During the first Jewish revolt, or during the Jewish revolt, they had first win. You know, they're winning against Rome. They actually start issuing coins, and we still have them that say the year one of the Messiah. Ah. You know, because they had beaten Rome at first. Rome, you know, knew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rome says, well, we will change your opinion quickly. About that. But <laughs> we were just dozing. Watch what happens when we're awake. Right, yeah. yeah it's kind of like, well, now you have my attention. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was, there were these people all over the place, you know, and, and so um, it's not surprising that people had a hard time believing it at first. Wow. Well, it's, I've got two different but related questions okay. that follow from that. One, because this is more critical and we're starting to run out of time, so I want to okay. get to this. What time is it? It's uh, 11.37. Okay. So um, maybe our last question. In fact. Okay. You said, talked about how you know, Jesus at one point, his family, mm -hmm. you know, says, we think you're bonkers, settle down, take a chill pill. Right. You know. Right. In, you know, I mean, apparently I mean, including his parents, including... Yeah, come and take your medicine. And it mentions brothers and sisters. And I've yes. heard what I feel are some lame excuses for saying brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm, I'll hold back on that until mm -hmm. I ask. Was Jesus an only child? Uh, if you talk to the Catholic Church, yes. If you ask me, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and that may be the distinction yeah, I needed to hear. Right. Um, the Catholic Church will tell you yes. Their argument, not necessarily bad. Um, the word brother in Greek is not necessarily as specific a familial relational term as it is in our world. And so it could mean like cousin. Mm -hmm. You know, it's possible. Um I, uh, and the other argument is it could be, again, there's that tradition of Joseph being the older man, and so along with that tradition goes he had children by another marriage, and so that these are his stepbrothers, not his actual brother brothers. Right. You know, um, that is all possible. I, I think, though, it's make Occam's razor, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what's the simplest? Simplest solution is, uh, okay, <laughs> he probably had brothers. Yeah. You know? um, uh, tradition says, there's a lot of tradition around James being, you know, not the apostle, but James and the book of Acts, that yeah. being Jesus' brother, you know. Um, uh, and you'll read elsewhere, it'll say, well, he appeared to his family and his apostles, uh, you know, that after he was resurrected, one of his appearances to his family, mm -hmm. you know. And, um so the Catholic Church has a lot invested in the idea that he has no brothers or sisters. I have less invested in that idea. So yeah. I, I can cash in my chips on that one. <laughs> well, that question came up for me today because of the gospel reading. Yeah. You know, and in the fact that it, it states that Jesus went through this ceremony and yeah. met Simeon and Anna because yeah. you had to have your firstborn dedicated to God. Yeah. And it's a paternalistic society, so mm -hmm. we're talking, right, the firstborn of Joseph. Yeah. So that right. would imply that Joseph did not have children prior to Jesus. Yeah, right, right. Or at least, right, Mary's firstborn, right. Yeah. You know, get, yeah, yeah. But right. it only, you know, it's, it's very clearly there. Again, 
nothing preceding Jesus, but it doesn't say anything about after. It's your firstborn. No. So why, and I've wondered this too, and I never really got an answer when I've bugged mm -hmm. priests about it, mm -hmm. but why is the Catholic Church so obsessed with Mary remaining a virgin throughout? I can see why the virgin birth is mm -hmm. critical, but I don't understand why it's important after that. Yeah, I, so Mary's perpetual virginity has to do with her holiness and her specialness. You know, she's... Um, uh, to keep her special and set apart, she is perpetually virgin, kind of in their system of thought. Yeah. Um, you got to remember, original sin is uh, in very literal Catholic theology. Original sin is passed on via sex you know um it's a very literal augustine's doctrine uh, very literally that's original sin is spread by the act of sex you know and, and that that's the chain of transmission from adam unto us i hadn't heard that before yeah and um, that implies that it's carried in the man then not the woman yes it is carried in the man yes okay yes now is that a carryover from the ancient belief that the man actually held the entire baby. You know, the, yeah, you know, it was all in, in the head of the sperm. And I, so the woman was just a vessel. Is that why they developed no, that theology? No, it's just um, Catholic theology has a lot of strange. Uh, I'm sorry, my brothers and sisters, Catholic thing. I won't say strange. Um, that was bad of me. I apologize. I was raised Catholic. Yeah. I'll say strange. <laughs> Catholic theology <laughs> has a different understanding of just. Uh, of sex and and its usage and its effects. Yeah, uh, I guess I would say. Uh, and so it's not quite that. It, it's more out of Aristotle than anything else. Okay. Um, uh, so there's lots of things. So, for example, big thing about Catholic theology is is the function of a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so a thing is natural if it everything has a purpose. And a thing is natural if it fulfills that one purpose. And it's unnatural if it deviates in any way from that singular purpose. Right? So, okay. so this is what determines what's natural and unnatural. Um, so sex, So this goes for sex. Sex has one purpose. Procreation. Procreation. Okay. Deviation from that purpose is unnatural. Um, so this is why birth control is off limits, is because... It's unnatural. It's preventing the one singular purpose of a thing. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is also so. This is this is the same reason. It's the same reason why um, homosexuality is not okay in Catholic thought. It's the same. Per sex is for procreation. There's no procreating going on. It's unnatural. Yeah. Um, it's also why the rhythm method's okay. It's because that's actually natural. You know, yeah, but um, it sounds like that that is why, and I've always wondered this, especially growing up in, in, in the Catholic Church, that there was always this undercurrent mm -hmm. that sex was evil. I, yeah, you know? it, 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 it perpetuate, right, and so it gets carried out of control. Catholic theology doesn't actually state this, but it's the logical conclusion everybody draws from it. Mm -hmm. the, the logical conclusion, when you say original sin is spread via sex, logical conclusion everybody draws is sex is evil right because uh, it's passing on sin right it's passing on sin ergo yeah. you're not supposed to draw that conclusion that's a that's not something the theology teaches and that's not something late you know that's something we draw we conclude from that thought which is a logical thought i think but yeah that's not a that's not actually in there for them it's just that's the conclusion everybody comes to yeah yeah and the, you know, the practice way down yeah, at uh, at the street level, mm -hmm. the dirt level. You're right. It definitely reflects that. And even my mom, I remember, mm -hmm. she used to tell me how she was instructed yeah. by the nuns at her school. Yeah. You right. know that if you go on a date, mm -hmm. and you know for whatever reason you have to sit on mm -hmm. the lap of your date. Right. Make sure you have a phone book on his lap, and yeah. then you sit on that. Right. It's all sorts of strange things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Part of it is also so. This is Augustine. St. Augustine kind of started a lot of this. And Augustine's a brilliant thinker, and he's like one of the greatest theologians ever. He had a lot of hang-ups 
around sex. And part of his hang-ups were sourced from the ancient world where sex was so much more common. I mean, you think our culture is sexualized. You know, like, go back to Rome in Augustine's day. Uh-huh. And so part of his... a lot When you carry 4th century ethics around sex into 21st century life, you get a lot of weird things. You know, like phone books. and you know. <laughs> Augustine's hang-ups were... I think perfectly logical hang-ups for the fourth century. For the fourth, for the right late three hundreds, early four hundreds. You know, I, those were logical hang-ups. Twenty um, first century. You know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's think about this. A moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and so yes. Um, so yeah, that's all tucked away wow. in there. That's. Fascinating, and it is nowhere near. We ended nowhere near where I thought, I, where I had thought we were going to go right. at the beginning. It is what it is. But it, yeah, mm-hmm. still very enlightening. And now that brings up some stuff I want to talk about. Obviously, we don't have time today, but yeah. later, mm-hmm. down to where then does life begin? And you know, technologically, mm-hmm. we're talking 21st century again. Mm-hmm. Where does it end? Because yeah. we now know it's not sudden. Right. Different parts of you die at different rates. So, mm-hmm. but that'll be another topic. Yeah, we can talk about beginning and ending of life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah, I did not expect the first Sunday after Christmas Q and A to yeah. kind of go this way. But that, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. <laughs> I yep. heard totally unplanned new things. Yeah. So. There we go. And thank you. Thanks everybody for watching. And don't forget, as you can see, the way this conversation went. Any question, nothing is off limits. So you can email us, questions at relc.org, email Pastor Dave at relc.org, post on our Facebook page, or in the chat. However you want to get it to us, ask your questions. Feel free. Nothing's off limits. So in the meantime, yeah, happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. How long does the season go? 12 days. So January 6th. It's Epiphany. All right. That's the end. All right. Until next week, have a groovy week. Yep.